It was November, and according to the season, most of the trees were bare. Most of the leaves had fallen to the ground. Silently, old leaves resigned to their fate. In the summer before, these leaves had witnessed a three-day battle where thousands of young soldiers had fallen to the ground, not silently, and not resigned to their fate. The three-day battle at Gettysburg was considered a turning point in the American Civil War. It was also a turning point for Gettysburg. This small crossroads town in southern Pennsylvania would never again be the same. After the armies moved on, the citizens of Gettysburg had the overwhelming task of dealing with the carnage left behind. The devastation and the numbers were too great. Many of the soldiers who died at Gettysburg would have to be buried there. Land was acquired next to the town cemetery. A new national cemetery was established. And to honor the Union soldiers who died there, a dedication ceremony was planned. Edward Everett, a renowned orator, accepted an invitation to be the principal speaker. President Abraham Lincoln was also invited to attend and to give a speech. But his reputation for being too witty or frivolous at solemn occasions made officials wary. Fearing the worst, they privately asked the president to make a few appropriate remarks. In 1834, Abraham Lincoln's political career began with his election to the Illinois State Legislature. 1846, elected to the United States House of Representatives, he served one term. 1855, he ran for the United States Senate and lost. In 1858, he ran for the United States Senate again and lost. In 1860, he was elected 16th president of the United States. By the time Lincoln took office in March of 1861, seven states had left the Union. One month later, in April of 61, Southern soldiers captured Fort Sumter, a federal fort located in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. It was the spark that ignited the American Civil War. The war was both unpopular and controversial. Unpopular because of the mounting death toll, the widespread destruction of property, and because friends and families were often pitted against one another. Even the White House did not escape. Three of Mrs. Lincoln's half-brothers and one brother-in-law died fighting for the South. It was controversial because it hinged on slavery, the slavery of Negroes who labored in the large cotton plantations of the South. Although the Founding Fathers believed in equality, they tended to overlook the practice of slavery. Yet it was Thomas Jefferson who warned that this momentous question would someday strike like a fire bell in the night. 
A fire bell came when new territories out west began petitioning for statehood. Back in 1820, the Missouri Compromise had balanced the free state of Maine with the pro-slavery state of Missouri. But in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed voters to decide whether their state would enter the Union pro-slave or free. To sway the vote, pro-slavers and free staters rushed into the new territories. But the mix of old and new, slave and free, caused instant trouble. In eastern Kansas and western Missouri, border warfare became so violent that the territory of Kansas acquired a more descriptive name, Bleeding Kansas. Another fire bill came in 1857. In the Dred Scott case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a slave was property and therefore not entitled to the rights of citizenship. A resolve of the Republican Party, founded in 1856, was to stop the spread of slavery. When Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate, was elected president in 1860, southern states began dropping out to form the Confederate States of America. Although Lincoln was hoping for a peaceful solution, he did not hesitate to defend the Union. He was against the United States becoming fragmented into separate countries like the kingdoms of Europe. And he believed slavery was a great moral evil. Lincoln said, if slavery isn't wrong, then nothing is wrong. Whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on them personally. During the summer of 1862, most confrontations on the Eastern Front occurred in the South. Then in September, General Robert E. Lee began moving his army north across the Potomac and into Union territory, where he hoped to score a decisive victory on northern soil. On September 17th, near the town of Sharpsburg, Maryland, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia encountered General George McClellan's Army of the Potomac. On September 17th, from morning till night, the two armies fought, held their ground, and destroyed each other. With over 23,000 casualties, the battle at Antietam Creek was the bloodiest day in American history. For Lee, the heavy losses forced a retreat back to Virginia. Lee's retreat also gave Lincoln the opportunity to draft a document that he'd been working with for some time. On January 1st, 1863, he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which stated that all persons held as slaves in any rebellious state should be then, thenceforward, and forever free. The following summer, in June 1863, Lee once again invaded the North, this time moving west of the Blue Ridge Mountains and into the rich farmlands of southern Pennsylvania. On June 30th, the small crossroads town of Gettysburg was occupied by Union cavalry. The Confederate Army, hoping to find shoes and other supplies at Gettysburg, sent an infantry division to drive the cavalry out. On the morning of July 1st, Union pickets stationed west of Gettysburg spotted Confederate soldiers heading towards town. When Union cavalry moved up to stop them, it was the beginning of the Battle of Gettysburg.
By afternoon, outnumbered Union troops were retreating through the town. That evening, they regrouped on two hills south of town, Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. Lee's generals pursued, then hesitated, then called off the attack. Had they continued, the outcome of the battle might have been quite different. During the night, General George Meade, newly appointed commander of the Army of the Potomac, brought in reinforcements. By morning, the Union line was no longer a weak position. On the morning of July 2nd, the two armies were facing each other, in most places about a half mile apart. That morning, Lee ordered an attack on both flanks. On the left flank, when the Confederate charge finally came in late afternoon, there was fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting in a peach orchard. A wheat field. Among the rocks and boulders of Devil's Den. And on the slopes of a small but strategic hill named Little Round Top. At Little Round Top, after a long and grueling struggle, the rebels were driven from the hill. On the right flank, as the sun was setting, Confederate troops stormed Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, but were stopped when Union reserves made a strong counterattack. Having hit both flanks hard, General Lee believed the center of the Union line would be vulnerable. On July 3rd, he called for a striking force of 13,000 men to penetrate Meade's army and cut it in two. It began at one o'clock with a cannon barrage. 150 cannons, all aimed at Cemetery Ridge. After the firing ceased, a haunting stillness came over the battlefield like the stillness that sometimes comes before a terrible storm. Then, at three o'clock, wave after wave of gray broke out from the shadows of Seminary Ridge and into an open field. 13,000 soldiers, a formation one mile wide and up to six ranks deep. Crouched behind a rock wall, Union soldiers were waiting. When the enemy got close, they unleashed a tremendous volley of rifle and cannon fire. Bullets and shrapnel tore through the ranks as Confederate soldiers fell in appalling numbers. 10 to 20 at a time, then 50, 60, even 100 at a time. At one point, they breached the rock wall, but only momentarily, as every Confederate soldier who crossed the wall was either killed or captured. With no chance of victory, the survivors straggled back to Seminary Ridge. The Battle of Gettysburg was over. Statistics for the three-day battle were staggering. More than 51,000 casualties, 51,000 dead, wounded, or missing. one out of every three who participated. 23,000 Union, 28,000 Confederate.
The Battle of Gettysburg was considered the high watermark of the Confederacy. Never again would Lee's army invade the North, nor would a Southern army launch a successful campaign in a Northern state. The Civil War, however, was far from over. It would go on for nearly two more years. Nearly two more years of death and destruction were yet to come. As the crow flies, it's only 60 miles from Washington, D.C. to Gettysburg. But by train in 1863, it was much longer. It took three separate railroads to get there. Lincoln decided to leave a day early lest unexpected delays or a bad connection cause them to miss the ceremony. He had prayed to God for a victory at Gettysburg, and even though the victory was incomplete, he had been looking for an opportunity to speak to the nation about the importance of the war. Just how fragile was a government conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal? Could a majority of the people preserve it? or could a minority bring it down whenever they chose? Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Actually, Lincoln had been preparing for this speech for quite some time, perhaps, as some would say, for most of his life. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809, in the backwoods of Kentucky. Seven years later, his family moved to southern Indiana where they built and lived in a log cabin. Lincoln said the story of his early life could be condensed into one line, the short and simple annals of the poor. He was nine years old when his mother died. A year later, his father married Sarah Bush Johnson, a widowed mother of three. His formal education amounted to about one year, but encouraged by his stepmother, he became an avid reader and a good speller. At age 22, he moved to a small village near Springfield, Illinois. At New Salem, he worked as a clerk, postmaster, and surveyor. Lincoln was six foot four inches tall, a head taller than most men of that day. He was wiry, strong, a champion wrestler, and he loved to tell stories. While at New Salem, Lincoln became interested in politics, and between 1834 and 1840, he was elected to four terms in the Illinois State Legislature. First at the state capitol in Vandalia, and later at the new state capitol in Springfield. Also in New Salem, he met Ann Rutledge, a young girl with whom he became close friends. When she died of typhoid fever at age 22, Lincoln was devastated. Working through fits of despair and depression, he began to study law. In 1837, he moved to Springfield and began working at a law firm. Here he met Mary Todd, a vivacious Southern belle from Lexington, Kentucky. After an on and off again relationship, they married in 1842. He was 33, she was nine years younger. Lincoln said he knew he was marrying into an important family because the Todds spelled their name with two D's, whereas God only needed one. The Lincolns had four children, all boys, Robert, Edward, William, and Thomas. In 1846, 
Lincoln was elected to the United States House of Representatives, where he served a two-year term. Shortly after he returned to Springfield, tragedy struck. In February 1850, their three-year-old son, Eddie, died of a lung infection. It was a severe blow to both parents, but Mary, it seemed, never fully recovered. In 1856, Lincoln joined the newly formed Republican Party. Two years later, in 1858, the Republican National Convention was held in Springfield, Illinois. Lincoln gave the closing speech and left no doubt about his position on slavery. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure, permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. In November 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. In February 1862, during the first year of the war, tragedy struck the Lincoln family again. Their 11-year-old son, Willie, died of typhoid fever. For nearly a month, Lincoln, who was very close to Willie, was incapacitated with grief. Once again, Mary was inconsolable. On November 18th, the day the Lincolns were to leave for Gettysburg, Thomas, nicknamed Tad, became seriously ill. Mary canceled her plans to go and became hysterical when Lincoln insisted on going by himself. As the train rolled to Gettysburg, Lincoln read the newspaper, conversed with friends, and worked from time to time on his speech. This speech would be different. He would not mention any names, describe the battle, or discuss the progress of the war, nor would he use any animal illustrations to make a point. Lincoln's animal analogies were legendary. He once told his general-in-chief, Henry Halleck, that the hen was the wisest of all animal creation because it never cackled until the egg was laid. At Gettysburg, Lincoln's language would take on a loftier, more somber tone. His words would not only honor the soldiers who were buried there, but would give meaning to their sacrifice. That these dead shall not have died in vain, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. On the morning of the 19th, Lincoln made a new copy of the speech, inserting some last thoughts, then headed downtown for a parade that was scheduled for 10 o'clock. With bands and cannon blasting away, the procession slowly made its way to the cemetery. Over 15,000 people had gathered and after the usual delays and introductions, the keynote speaker was introduced. Edward Everett had had a long and distinguished career. He entered Harvard at age 13 and four years later graduated at the top of his class. He had been a minister, a governor, a senator, president of Harvard and secretary of state under President Millard Fillmore. Then at age 56, he launched a new career as a public speaker. Famous for his historical interpretations, he was the logical choice for this event. But at age 68, his health was failing, and some people close to him feared he would not hold up. 
However, after he started, it was obvious that he had risen to the occasion. When Everett finished, Chief Marshal Ward Lamon stood up and announced, The President of the United States. As a nearby photographer was carefully adjusting his large camera, Lincoln rose to speak, slowly and mostly from memory. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here had thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Everett had spoken for nearly two hours, Lincoln for just over two minutes. The cameraman, surprised by the brevity of the speech, did not get a picture. First reactions were mixed. Some said dull and commonplace, silly, flat and dishwatery, an insult to the memory of the dead. Yet others described it as brief and beautiful, large and lofty, the right thing at the right place. No one at that time could have predicted that in the years to come, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address would be singled out as one of the truly great speeches in American history. Brief and simple, it could easily have been forgotten. Ten sentences, 271 words, most of which were common words, having only one syllable. Only 13 of the 271 words had three syllables. The language and style was not new to Lincoln. He had been using it most of his adult life. It came from the ancient Greeks, Shakespeare, contemporary books on American history, and from the Holy Bible. The cadence and rhythm came in part from the coupling of words. So conceived and so dedicated, little note nor long remember, and from using certain words over and over again. Dedicated, consecrated, nation. The day following the ceremony, a letter arrived at the White House. It was from Edward Everett. I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. 
to which Lincoln graciously replied, In our respective parts you could not have been excused to make a short address, nor I a long one. Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant, commander of all Union land forces. The American Civil War was over. Five days later, while attending a play at Ford's Theater, President Lincoln was shot and mortally wounded by the eccentric stage actor John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln would not lead the nation in the aftermath of the war, nor would he know how famous his Gettysburg Address would become. Only a year and a half before, on that eventful November day, Edward Everett's strong voice and dramatic flair made his long speech a shining example of skilled oratory. In contrast, Lincoln's high-pitched voice, motionless stance, and abbreviated talk seemed comparatively out of place. His words, however, came right from the heart. Grieving from the recent death of one son and concerned about the illness of another, his anguish spilled over to the hundreds of sons who had here given their lives, their last full measure of devotion, that this nation might live. that this nation should have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from the earth. As it turned out, the world would take little note of Edward Everett's long, well-crafted oration. But it would long remember Abraham Lincoln's few appropriate remarks.